a and then we will get started could i request somebody to pray with the class please You could go ahead. Please go ahead, Tasha. Gracious and loving Father, we thank you for another wonderful morning. We thank you, Lord, as we come and avail ourselves to learn and to be used by you. Learn about your holiness because you said, Be ye holy because I am holy. You are God and you're sovereign. And we come, Lord, at your feet this morning. Download from heaven in us, Father, as we ascribe to you this morning to learn more of your fullness and also in part in our lives mm -hmm. make it a part of our daily lifestyle mm -hmm. in jesus name amen 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 thank you thank you okay good morning everyone um you're going to continue we're continuing in our study on um holiness specifically talking about overcoming the, the flesh the world and the devil the practical side of it and if i'm not mistaken i think end of last class um abraham had a question and we said you can ask it next class so abraham is that right? Did you want to ask a question before you go forward? You were asking something uh, yes, a lot towards the end of the class last time, and I. Yes, Pastor. Yes, what I was sharing was that I normally share on Sundays in my group. Okay. But anytime I I see the move of God, because all meetings are not the same. Some of the meetings you will just know that God wants to do something. And as a result of that, we will ask for prayer or we go in, I mean, we, we demand for the supernatural. And after those meetings, when I come back home, that is where I begin to have these small, small challenges, my personal challenges. That is, why are you in ministry? Why can't you settle down? Why are you wasting your time? You know, all those kind of thoughts keep coming back. It doesn't happen every time. It only happens after a strong move of the Holy Spirit. Mm. So I just wanted to know because I've heard that if you engage the supernatural and you are not at that level, there can be a backlash. So I just wanted to be sure that I should remain in my lane or I should be very uh, built up before I do certain things when I go to share or preach. Mm. Mm. Okay. I I think I understand your question. I hope I, I hope I understood it correctly. Um, okay, just okay. Two things. Two things. See, one is, uh, and if you, if you take the example, the Old Testament example of Elisha, you know he he, and I'm just using this as an example, right? So he had this wonderful ministry on Mount Carmel, where he, you know, um, he was a, that the fire came down, burned the sacrifice, he, uh, the prophets of Baal were exposed, and he killed the prophets of Baal, and the people said, you know, we will serve the Lord our God, so it was a very powerful time. But then right after that, he went into a time of great discouragement, uh, simply because he got afraid and, you know, Jezebel said, you know, I'm going to kill uh, Elijah the prophet. I'm going to, you know, before the end of the day, I'll, I'm going to take him out. And so Elijah ran for his life and all of that. So, so I'm just using that as an example where, and I'm not saying it has to happen all the time, but there are times when, you know, we have a wonderful time of ministry and of course the devil doesn't like it. And so there are going to be those thoughts of intimidation and, all those kinds of things, you know, coming against our mind, trying to uh, discourage us, so on and so forth. So that's one side of it. So, uh, you know, th these are battles we have to fight. 
we all have to fight. Uh, we're not exempt. We're not exempt from the enemy trying to do things against us or trying to discourage us or uh, keep us down. Yeah, we all fight those battles, you know. And uh, but that's why we have to be strong. And we say, no, I reject these thoughts. Uh, I know what God has called me to do, and I'm staying focused on it. I'm going to press forward. Okay, so that's one thing. Which is, I'm saying, yeah, there is an enemy that's going to try to discourage all of us. Uh, as we pursue the things God wants us to do. Of course, he, the enemy doesn't want us to uh, do the will of God for our lives. That's one side of it. The other side of it is we don't have to be afraid of backlash. Say, so what do you mean? You know, um, um, how, how, I'm trying to see how best to say this, but... You know, uh, in the early days of when, when I was starting out, I always used to hear, I mean, I used to hear people say this, oh, you go on a ministry time, uh, when you come back, you're going to face a backlash. But then I chose that that's not what I'm going to have. I said, the Bible tells me that nothing will by any means hurt me. The Bible tells me and first John 5, 18, 19, that whoever is born of God keeps himself and that wicked one does not touch him. So that is what I want to experience, that I'm going to go minister, go on missions, do other things, but I'm not going to suffer a backlash. I mean, I don't care if the enemy doesn't like what I'm doing. He, he tries to, you know, retaliate or whatever. I'm still covered. I'm covered before I do the mission strip. I'm covered during the mission strip, and I'm covered after the mission strip the same way. Nothing has changed. So if the enemy cannot touch me before, if he cannot touch me during, he's not going to touch me after, right? So that was my position. And, and honestly, you know, we've traveled so many trips and so many different things. And, and I, I, I don't, I, if you ask me, I, I have not, necessarily felt oh this is a backlash and I have cannot do anything or I'm struggling or because I went on a mission trip I've not had any of those kinds of experiences because I just chose to say what does the word of God say I'll stay with the word of God you know so that's the other part so one part yeah we recognize the enemy is always you know is going to try to discourage all of us and you know try to keep us from moving forward in the will of God. But on the other hand, we also have been given weapons. We also have been given the word to stand strong. And uh, if the enemy is trying something, we are always stronger. We are going to live victorious and overcome. So that's how I would encourage you to approach that. And uh, don't expect um, the enemy to do it. You know, Job said, the thing that I have greatly feared has come upon me. So that's the thing. You know, if we fear or if fear is wrong expectation, expectation on the bad thing, faith is expectation towards God. So when we fear, then that's what you're going to get. But then you choose to stand with the word and overcome it. Okay. Hope it helps, Abraham. I will turn up your position. Thank you so much, Pastor. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So today uh, we're going to just try and finish up that first section on overcoming the flesh, right? We were, we've been talking about this. And, uh, you know, so how do we practically overcome the flesh? Uh, we said first is we must know that we are free from the power of sin, right? Know that truth, you know, uh, knowing the truth is what's going to help us walk in the truth and experience that freedom. So know the truth of what God has done for us in Christ. Secondly, we said to overcome the flesh, we must use the word of God in relation to that area of weakness or the area of temptation. Right? Use the word of God. The word of God has been given to cleanse us, to renew our minds. Uh, it's given to us to uh, as a weapon against the enemy. So the word of God is very powerful. And use the word in relation to the area of temptation, the area of weakness. You know, so we were just talking about some examples. 
you know, if, if lying, uh, speaking on truth uh, is an area of weakness, then pick, take the scriptures uh, in relation to that. And we've just mentioned a few uh, and begin to use them. If uh, sexual immorality uh, is an area of weakness where, you know, we feel that um, our sexual appetites are controlling us wrong sexual desires and so then that's where you take the scriptures and cleanse your mind with the word of god and when temptation comes that is when your own desires are trying to pull you that's when we speak we remind ourselves uh, by speaking the word or putting our mind or our thoughts on those particular scripture passages and i've just listed some here a few of them not all of them but a few of them so for example first corinthians 6 13 to 20 uh paul writes and he teaches us that you know for the food is for the stomach stomach for the food so this is a leg legitimate thing yeah food is for the stomach stomach is for the food god created it but uh, God will destroy both it and them. That means one day, it, all this will pass away. The food and the stomach will no longer matter. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So he's saying, look, there is sexuality, but then there is sexual immorality. And the body is not meant for immorality, but the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. So this is so important. Your body is for the Lord and the Lord is for your body. So when you feel the pull or the temptation of immoral sexual desires, what must we do? We need to tell ourselves the body is for the Lord, the Lord is for the body. So one of the things that I do is I say, God, I thank you. I consecrate all my appetites, all my sexual desires. I consecrate it to you. And I just declare in the name of Jesus, all my sexual desires, all my sexual appetites are consecrated. They are sanctified. They are set apart and they are set holy for God. And because the body with all of its sexual desires. The body is the container of appetites, and one of them is sexual appetite. It's for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. And he says, you know, God will raise up. The God who raised up the Lord, he's going to raise us up, raise us up by his power. That means our bodies are going to be resurrected. To that end, to that extent, the Lord has committed himself to our bodies, right? To raising it up by his power. And then he says in verse 15, and this is something to think about. Don't you know that your bodies, he's talking about our physical bodies. Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? Now this is such a powerful thing. It's a big thing he's saying says your bodies, he's talking about these physical bodies. They are members or part of Christ. You know, now many times when we talk about being in Christ and being part of Christ, we only think in terms of spiritual. Yeah, spiritually. I'm a part of that spiritual body of Christ. Spiritual. Actually, I am one with Christ and I am in him and he is in me spiritually, which is all very true. But Paul is going a step further and he's saying, your physical body is part of Christ. So how should I perceive my physical body? I should not separate out my spirit and my physical body, that, okay, spiritually I'm one with Christ and physically I'm not. No, what is Paul saying? He's saying your physical body is a part of Christ. That means your physical body is belongs 
to Christ just as much as your spirit body, your spiritual person belongs to Christ. It means your whole being, that's how he sums it up, uh, sums up verse 20. Your whole being, spirit, soul, and body belongs to Christ. So your physical body is also part of Christ. So, obvious question, can I take what is part of Christ and put it you know, into immorality? which is in making it part of a, a, a prostitute. No, I can't do that. Certainly not. I can't take what belongs to Christ, that is, you know, my physical body, and put it into a place of sin like this. No, it cannot, it cannot be. Certainly not. So how should we view the body with its appetites? First, it's for the Lord. So you consecrate all your appetites, all your desires, all your affections, all your passions. Say, Lord, my body is for you. You are for my body. And God is so committed to your body, he's going to raise it up with his power. Secondly, your body is a part of Christ. So you look at your body and say, body, you belong to Jesus. You, you're part of Christ. So we don't disconnect our body from our spiritual identity. Yes, spiritually we're connected with Christ, but that in includes our physical body. So he says, you know, don't you know, when you're joined to a harlot, you become one body with her. The two, he says, become one flesh. But he was joined to the Lord as one spirit. So he's saying, look, we have been joined to the Lord, we believers, have been joined to the Lord spiritually, but that spiritual union extends all the way to our physical bodies. So I am in Christ. But my being in Christ also means that my body becomes a part of Christ. That's what he wants us to see. And therefore, I cannot give my body to do something wrong. Now think about some of the ideas that are float, floating around in the name of grace. And some of the ideas, that, well, I've heard people mention these, where they say, you see, when you sin, your body sins, your spirit doesn't. Wait a minute. They say, you know, in this part of this grace teaching. And this is, I, I'm not against grace. We, we are all saved by grace. But I'm just against misusing grace, right? And saying things that are not true in the name of grace. And one of the notions is that for a believer, his body sins, but it's not, doesn't, it's not a spiritual sin. God doesn't see it. Because spiritually you're in Christ. Well, listen to what Paul is saying. Paul is saying you're spiritually one with Christ. And because you're spiritually one with Christ, your body becomes part of Christ. That means God has taken you whole, spirit, soul, and body, and made you part of Christ. Your whole being now belongs to Jesus. You can't exclude your physical body from your relationship with Jesus. Now, of course, our relationship with Jesus is one spirit with him. That means we are spiritually one with him, of course. But being spiritually one with him means it includes my body being a part of Christ. That's what he's saying. And so because your body is also part of Christ, you can't just get, give your body over to sexual sin. So he says, flee sexual immorality. Flee, get away, run away from this. See, so there are some sins you stand and resist, some sins you run away and resist. Some sins you resist by standing and saying no. Some sins you resist by running away and saying no. And sexual sins you resist by running away. You stand and resist the devil 
you run away to resist sexual sin. Why? Because you cannot trust your own flesh. So it will bring us to another very important point in the next, uh, I will mention it. I'll mention it here and I'll repeat it again. Don't, when it comes to sexual sin, don't trust yourself. When it comes to sexual things, don't put yourself in a place where you're going to be vulnerable. Don't even do it. Don't say, oh, no, I'm very strong. I will resist it there. No. When it comes to sexual sin, you have to flee. You have to run. Not stand and resist. You have to run and resist. And run away from it. Remove your play. Remove yourself from that place. That's what flee means. Run away from it. So, example. Don't put yourself in a place where you have to be alone with somebody in the opposite sex. Don't put yourself in a place like that. You know, uh, just some practical examples. I mean, if you come to our church office, every, everything is made with glass. And we purposely set it up that way uh, because we want people to see. You know, I remember a long time ago, uh, I, I went to meet a pastor and uh, he invited me to his office room and I was shocked because his the entrance to his office do room was a wooden door that means nobody can see who is inside the office was completely closed I mean uh, it was air conditioned of course but nobody knows who is sitting inside and what's happening inside so I was I was like Hmm, I would never sit in an office like this. Because if a woman walks in and I shut the door, nobody will know what's going on behind the door. So that's, you know, that's one reason. You know, when we built our office, we purposely put everything glass. Everybody can see. So, uh, you know, if a, if a lady comes to talk to me, she comes in, everybody knows, they can see, they have, I'm sitting and having a conversation. There is no, you know, no possible things. Okay, see and go. So that's just one example. Then sometimes, if you know uh, somebody says, "I want to talk to you personally," I would say, "You can talk to me in public." You, know, you talk to me when everybody's there, where everybody's there. Yes, you know, so I would never meet with a woman alone. Don't do that. You see why? Because you can't trust yourself. You can't trust your flesh. And what the Bible tells us is to flee immorality. In this, in this, is, this is one area where you don't stand there to resist sexual sin. You run away from sexual sin. You don't even, don't even give that an opportunity. Right? So every sin a man does he commits outside the body, but if you commit sexual sin, you're sinning against your own body. So that means, you know, example, if you lie, okay, you, you know, that your lying might affect something else outside. You know, it may affect some relationship or effect, it may affect your money or your whatever, something external to you. But sexual sin, you're affecting your own self, your own body. So he says, be careful. Further, he says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In this explaining to us of how holy we got to treat our body because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, your body is also purchased by God. Your body is God's. Now, you were bought. And when you were bought, your whole body, spirit, soul, and body was bought. So, in the context of sexual appetites, this is a powerful passage to study. Um, and uh, let me just summarize what Paul is teaching us. He's saying, understand that your body is for the Lord. 
That means all, everything in your body, all your sexual appetites, passions, they are for God. And God is for your body. If God is for your body, he is the Lord who sanctifies. That means your body is sanctified. Then your body is a part of Christ. Because your spiritual union with him makes every, every part of you one with him, including your body. Therefore, flee sexual sin. Run away. Don't stand there to resist. Run away from it. Because sexual sin affects your body. It enslaves your body. Other things may affect things outside, but this is a sin that affects your body. You know, there, there are repercussions on your own body. Some other things to remember is your body is a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Your body has been purchased by God and therefore belongs to God. It's a very powerful passage to, you know, to use when you're battling sexual sin or sexual temptations. Another parallel passage is uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. He says, you know, know that this is God's will for you, that you should abstain, that you should stay away, don't even play with it, abstain from sexual immorality. And you should know how to possess your own vessel in sanctification and honor. That means your own vessel is your own body, that you should know how to have charge, have control over your own body, keeping it in holiness, that sanctification, and in honor. So hold your body in holiness and honor. So you possess your own vessel. Nobody else can do this for you. So it says you abstain from sexual immorality, and you hold your own body in holiness and honor. So this you is your spirit, your, your inner person. You hold your vessel. And he says, don't follow you know, the Gentiles. They are, they are fulfilling the passions of their evil desires, that is lust, but we are not like that. That we don't go and defraud even our own brother in this matter. Don't cheat your own brother, so don't do that. God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. How did God call us? His calling over us is holiness. But if we reject this commandment, we're actually rejecting what God desires for us. And he's the one who's given us his Holy Spirit. So this is, again, another passage. You remind yourself. These are two passages we can use. Uh, I'm sure there are many more. Uh, but you can use, you know, just to remind yourself. You constantly, you meditate in it uh, until, you know, it, it becomes of a desire to walk in holiness in this area. So like this, you know, we must learn to use the scriptures in all uh, many other areas where uh, we will face temptation, okay? Uh, and you can put the scriptures together on these uh, different areas. Right? Number three is uh, we walk in the spirit and crucify the flesh. So while we are using the word of God to deal with uh, the wrong desires of the flesh, we also yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask you to help me. Holy Spirit, I'm facing this. Please help me. Holy Spirit, I, I, I can feel the pull of this evil desire. Please help me. Right. So I say, I submit myself to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you fill me and you help me overcome the flesh, overcome the desire. So I'm drawing strength from the Holy Spirit by praying. So uh, we've talked about this uh, earlier. You know, um, he says, if by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, right? So the Holy Spirit will help us to put to death the deeds of the body. And uh, so we pray, Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, fill me. And Holy Spirit, help me put to death the deeds of the body. 
and we have discussed Romans 8, 26, you know, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. So he's willing to help us in our weaknesses. And how will, we, how will, we, how will he do it? It's going to be through intercession, the prayer that he prays together with us. So when it says prayer for us, it doesn't mean he's going to do it independently of us, but he's doing it together with us because he's helping us in our weaknesses. Right? So he takes us into this place of intercession and a place of prayer to help us overcome our weaknesses. So we must learn to pray in the spirit and draw strength from the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, whether he, you know, sometimes the pull of the temptation, the struggle may be uh, so strong, you may need to just get away and pray for several hours. But if that's what it's going to take, do it, right? You take some time to God today and keeping this day aside to battle against um, the pull of this weakness in my flesh. Uh, I, I want the Holy Spirit to help me. You know, just go on and pray for one hour, two hours, three hours, whatever. You know, just pray until you're strengthened with the help of the Holy Spirit to deal with that weakness of your flesh. Okay. But the thing, the beautiful thing is this, when the Holy Spirit helps us put to death the deeds of the body, you know, uh, we can walk in victory. And, and that, that's, that's a beautiful place to be. Right? But it does require us engaging with the Holy Spirit in prayer to overcome the weakness of our flesh. Okay, And uh, then this is true. This becomes true in our lives that we who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Lord, I thank you that I who am Christ, I crucify the flesh, I put to death the flesh with its passions and desires. Right? So understand this, that Sometimes crucifixion is not, not sometimes, but you know, most of, most of the time crucifying the flesh is not an easy thing. It's a painful thing, right? But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can do it. And Jesus said, you know, it's, it's like this, that um, uh, it's like plucking out that part of you which is causing you to sin. He said, if your eye is causing you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. So that's how painful it may be in dealing with something that's causing you to sin. But Jesus said, that's what we need to do. Obviously, it's not talking about, you know, physically plucking your eye or cutting your hand. He's using it as, a, uh, as, a, as an expression to tell us that, look, you have to deal with it with such severity. Cut it off, pluck it out, cast it away from you, right? So it, it requires that painful process, but the Holy Spirit will give us the strength to do it. And lastly, well, actually two, two points here, is make no provision for the flesh. So I had mentioned this earlier. You know, the Bible says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That means you walk as Christ walked. That's what it means to put on. Be like Jesus. Imitate him. Put him on. You know. So when people see you, they see Jesus. So put on the Lord Jesus. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Make no provision for the flesh. Don't give your flesh any opportunity. So this is so important. And I was... Speaking of this a little earlier, make no provision for the flesh. Don't trust your own flesh. Don't say, well, I will be in that place. I know I'm going to get tempted, but I think I can handle it. Never do it. That's foolish. It's better to stay away from the place of temptation, especially in these matters. So better to stay away from that. Don't even get into that place. Make no provision for your flesh. And so you have to think of ways by which you make no provision for the flesh. For example, when I'm traveling alone, now, you know, when I travel for ministry, uh, there are times we travel as a team. Um, 
and then there are times when you know if it's only a one day trip or two day trip then i don't need to take a team i could just go and come back now even when we travel as a team i i like to have my own room my room by myself simply because you know i like to rest when i want to rest and I like to pray when i want to pray and or if i'm meditating i don't like to have conversation keep talking to people and i need to be quiet so i like to have my own space now that also means i have to be more careful so some of the things for instance when i'm i'm traveling uh on ministry and i'm having my own room i don't turn on the television you know there there may be a television in the hotel room or whatever i don't even turn it on i don't need to and if i want if i want to keep up with the news i can read you know i can read bbc news on my phone uh i don't need to turn on the television because the moment you turn on the television you can flip channels and you can end up in a channel you're not supposed to be watching or with things that you're not supposed to be seeing so i just don't even turn on the television i don't need to so you know or if anybody wants to meet me uh i i would usually tell them you know to meet me in the lobby or somebody i don't don't let them unless it's somebody i really trust or one of uh, you know uh, a a male member of our team okay yeah if we need to discuss yeah you can come to my room otherwise everybody else we will meet outside nobody meets alone in my room unless i said like i said it's a male person of our team whom i trust and whom uh you know i need to meet personally otherwise it's everything in public you know so no opportunity nothing you know that uh, everything is uh you basically you're protecting yourself right so if if i have to travel i'll never travel with a, a female member alone no it's going to be a team people all all around so we're all traveling together uh and these are things that you just do why it's, it's because you are protecting yourself and you're protecting other people so you don't give any opportunity for the flesh you know make no provision for the flesh so those are just some simple things you know and so depending on whatever you know areas where you you, you seem to be falling you need to make sure that there's no reason that you don't even give it an opportunity uh to fall make no provision for the flesh you need to be careful right and um yeah so some thoughts on that here you know uh and be careful of the kind of company you keep and lastly one small point is uh, get another believer to walk with you uh, in this area depending on the help you need so if you seriously have a problem uh be accountable at least for a period of time uh with another believer uh, who can hold you accountable so that you are following you know these instructions so to overcome the flesh just to sum up know the truth that you're free from the power of sin number 2 is to use the word of god in relation to your weakness or temptation about three depend on the holy spirit ask him for his strength be walk in the spirit and 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 pray uh the prayer is so important here in order to crucify the flesh number 4 always choose to be like jesus and don't give any opportunity don't give any opportunity no room no space for the flesh and if needed get another believer to walk with you right we are here to help each other we are here to support each other so you can get somebody's help uh, for a season for a period of time until you're strong enough and you know you've gained mastery over that area of your life okay so any questions before we get into the next uh, part which is overcoming the world let me pause here and see if any questions any questions It runs with me so far. Yes, Pastor. Okay. 
Okay, um, Divya, you have a question, go ahead. Yes, Pastor, thank you. Uh, I, I was just thinking about the verse in James where it says, friendship with the world is enmity to God. Uh, in what context, actually? Because as people, we are in the world and mm -hmm. it is not like we have to hate uh, people around us. Or So what is the context of saying that friendship with the world is enmity towards God? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, like you said, we are, of course, in the world. Uh, we have to engage with the world practically. Uh, we interact with every, you know, with people in the world, all of that. But what is he saying is this, you know, in James 4, he's saying he's contrasting friendship with God versus friendship with the world. Don't you know that if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy with God? So he actually uses very strong words. He says, you adulterers and adulteresses. So what, if you think about an adulterer or an adulteress, what has happened? They have left their first love and become affectionate towards someone else. That's an adulterer. So James is telling us believers, don't be adulterers. Don't be adulteresses. That means don't leave your first love and become in love with the world. So, so, you know, if you want to summarize what he's saying, we keep our love for God supreme. We keep our love for God untouched. That's, that's an area and a space nothing else interferes with. While we meaningfully engage with the world, you know, we, we all have responsibilities, we, uh, we have things to do, and there are things in the world we can enjoy. You know, because First Timothy 6 and verse 17, it says, God gives us richly all things to enjoy. Uh, so God has given us good things in, the, in this world that we can enjoy, right? So you can enjoy good food. You can enjoy beautiful places to see. Uh, you can enjoy people. Uh, you can enjoy good friendships with people. Uh, you can enjoy good community. Uh, so many good things out there in this world that we can enjoy. But... Uh, our enjoyment or uh, enjoying the good things God has given to us will never take us away from our first love. So we're always there, fix on our first love while we meaningfully engage with the world, all to you know, do what God wants us to do and glorify God. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. S Thank you. Um, Elisha has a question. What are the implications to sin against your own body? Um, so we we see this. So we, we saw in First Corinthians uh, chapter six, right? When when Paul says, "He who commits sin, uh, sexual immorality, he sins against his own body," right? Uh, this is in First Corinthians six and verse uh, eighteen. And uh, then we also see in First Peter chapter 2, and I think it's verse 11, he says, fleshly lusts war against the soul. Fleshly lusts war against the soul. So we are looking at these two scriptures, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, 1 Peter 2, 11. Let me just put this. Uh, we also see another scripture, for example, in Proverbs 6, I think it's verse 20. Let me just verify it. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 20, not verse 20, sorry. Um, uh, Proverbs 6.32. Proverbs 6, verse 32. And I would, you know, we could also read the preceding verses. Anyway, so when we, are, when, when we are committing sexual immorality, the Bible is telling us we are sinning against our own body. First Peter 2.11 says, you know, when we give into these fleshly lusts, we are warring against our own soul. Proverbs 6.30, actually the preceding verses says, it's like taking fire into your own bosom. Uh, it's like you are self-destructing or self-destroying. You're, you're destroying your own self. So what can we say? 
when a person is engaging in fleshly lusts, specifically with uh, sexual immorality, it is self-destructive in many ways. One is the body is being becoming more and more enslaved. Um, the person may not understand it or realize it, but he is becoming more and more a slave. Second, his emotions, the soul, and you see this in First Peter 2, 11 and Proverbs 6, 32, his own emotions are being destroyed. They're warring, it's like a war being set up in his emotional world. And it's becoming very destructive emotionally. So he's becoming a slave, body, soul. There's a war being set on. And his Proverbs 6 that he says he destroys his own soul, his mind, will, emotions. So both his body and his soul are being affected. And that's like he's sinning against himself. He's, he's hurting himself, doing wrong to himself. Is that okay? Right. That's okay, Pastor. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so we have um, um, Christopher, we'll take your question. Then. Yes, Pastor. Um, uh, I'm just trying to. I'm just referring to the notes. Actually, you mentioned about the yeah, illustration is arm wrestling. Mm. I just wanted to explain that a bit. Um, um, I mean, it just seemed to me that you know, uh, I don't know how extreme it is, but maybe you can explain that. Uh, you know, the what what you what, what do you mean by arm wrestling? Oh, okay. Uh, I so, guess a related question. Mm. Sorry. Go ahead, Chris. I just a related question is about uh, you know, crucifying the flesh, and um, uh, uh, you know, I guess coming from a from a more denominational church uh, earlier, mm. uh, you know, what comes to mind is this, you know, uh, sometimes extremes, you know, that people go to, and they are even practiced by the by by you know by those uh, denominational churches where you know people are um, maybe in the form of repentance, uh, you know, they have uh, they are you know literally whipping themselves, you know, with uh, with whips to you know. Hmm. Gain repentance as well as you know, sort of a punishment, and hmm. kind of a return to, to uh, you know, to committing the same sin again. So I uh, just want to get your on that. Okay. All right. So this arm wrestling, uh, I, I usually use that illustration when I'm speaking to a live audience. I, I couldn't do that. I, I mean, I, it's difficult to do it here. But okay, just imagine. You know, so we, I, I need another person to help me. So imagine, you know, two people are doing arm wrestling, right? And uh, imagine this is the sin that I'm overcome, trying to fight against. And this is me, my inner person, trying to fight against the sin. And, you know, if this arm less, you know, we're trying to do an arm wrestling. Now, imagine another arm comes over mine. That's the arm of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, in my own self, I might be losing, you know, sin may be over this desire must, might be overpowering me. But when the Holy Spirit puts his hand around me, I can overcome uh, the sin, the weakness. I just use that illustration when I'm speaking to a live audience, uh, but it's difficult to do it while I'm alone. So that was, that was the point there. Uh, basically, when the Holy Spirit empowers us, we can overcome whatever we are fighting against. Now, about, um, you know, about that, uh, you know, that, self-flagellation type of self-discipline. I think it's it's a misunderstanding of what uh, the scriptures are teaching us, right? So when the scripture is talking about the flesh, uh, it's talking about the desires of the flesh and crucifying the flesh is crucifying the desire of the flesh. And it doesn't mean that we punish the physical body in like manner. You know, where somebody, somebody they, they whip themselves or nail themselves or all do these strange things. That is not what uh, God is intending. Uh, this is a spiritual struggle. 
right? With the help of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the intent is not to do the physical things, but uh, to, um, to uh, deal with it by the Holy Spirit. Let me just uh, mention a few scriptures in Colossians chapter 2. Uh, Paul addresses this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 to 23. Uh, and it's a long passage, but he, Colossians 2, 16 to 23, he talks about people who, uh, uh, they, you know, they, they, they subject people to regulations, don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. And also he talks about in verse 23, uh, he talks about uh, neglect of the body. In other words, uh, you know, there's this form of uh, 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 punishing the physical body, but he says, uh, you know, this is really of no value against the indulgence of the flesh, meaning they are doing the self-imposed religion, they're doing the neglect of the body, they're punishing the physical body, but that in itself is no, of no value against the real battle we are trying to fight. So, uh, so you know, we must understand we are not talking about some kind of a physical punishment of the body. We are talking about being empowered by the Holy Spirit to deal with the ungodly desires of the flesh. Yeah. Okay, one last question um, from Elisha, and then we'll close up. But today we'll continue this on Wednesday. Uh, it, uh, Elijah makes a comment. It seems to me sin is too strong a spiritual force over the flesh, even believer, even in believers. Why it's so? I think it's all because of the emphasis, the emphasis that we are laying, and perhaps so even in the church, um, we emphasize a lot on you know things of the natural instead of emphasizing things of the spirit. And so, you know, we, we kind of tend to feed the natural instead of feeding the spirit. Um, so whatever you feed becomes strong. So if you're feeding the natural instead of feeding the spirit, then the emphasis on the, on the natural and, uh, and the spirit actually is weak. So um, spiritually, believers are weak uh, and therefore the flesh seems to dominate. But if he strengthen believers spiritually with the word of God, with the things of the Holy Spirit, then believers will be strong to overcome the flesh. Right? So if we can emphasize more and more on, on the things of God, the things of the Spirit, we will have believers who are strong spiritually and they will live victorious. Very well, Pastor. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, we'll close for today. We'll pick this up on Wednesday. I will talk about overcoming the world uh, and how how you know how we can do that practically. Okay, could somebody please pray and dismiss us? Can I pray, Pastor? Okay, go ahead, Devia. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the, for this uh, wonderful opportunity, Father Lord, that uh, you have given us a uh, lot to learn uh, what, what we face, Father Lord. We, we may not see it in the natural, Father, but there are so many things, Father, that uh, uh, we need to be aware of. We need to be intentionally fighting, Father, with the help of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for all the um, faculties of the human spirit that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that that uh, uh, empowers us and strengthens us. Thank you for your word. We thank you for all the spiritual weapons that you've given us, Lord. Mm -hmm. You help us, you train our spirits, minds, mm -hmm. our bodies, Lord, to uh, uh, further stand firm, to fight against the schemes uh, of the evil one, uh, fight against the weaknesses in our flesh, Lord. Your word says, uh, uh, Lord, your grace is sufficient for us, Lord. We uh, completely depend upon you, Father, Lord. 
that uh, uh, in the coming days lord uh, we will uh, father be able to overcome father lord by uh, by the holy spirit by uh, your word father by the uh, power of your word we thank you lord uh, we uh, commit uh, pastor ashish and each and every student assembled here father we pray that you continue to strengthen us empower us and uh, help us to inspire many others as well uh, unto you lord all these we pray in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen 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 thank you thank you everyone uh, see you all tomorrow god bless you uh, enjoy your afternoon god bless thank you pastor thank you everyone god bless thank bye you pastor all. god bless you bye now god bye bye god bless you all tomorrow enjoy your afternoon god bless